Again, we are glad that you are here to worship with us. First, let me just say a big, huge uh, thank you to all of you uh, who uh, helped me celebrate my 50th birthday uh, last week. Uh, I was surprised. Everybody kept saying there's no way he could have been surprised. I was totally surprised. Uh, you guys kept the secret well. Um, and for about three days, I was trying to figure out how it got around without me knowing about it. Because to be quite honest with you, that's not good news for a pastor. <laughs> So, other than my 50th birthday, I don't want any other emails going around that I don't know about, but, but I did try to figure that out and, and found the culprit and, and how it was done, and, and so, um, anyway, but we're, thank you for, for all the cards, the notes, uh, the gift cards, the blessings, um, it was a total surprise, and it was uh, very much appreciated, so thank you, I wanted to say that. We have been doing this series called Rooted. Um, out of the book of Colossians. And so if you haven't been here, uh, you can do one of two things. You can go online to, to thevineonline.com and the messages will be there if you want to catch up. Or you can literally just begin reading through the book of Colossians because that's really what we've been looking at, the main part of what we've been looking at each week. We're talking about being rooted because we're trying to talk about what it means to be... This is what happens when you're 50. You have a file cabinet in your coat pocket <laughs> where your glasses are. There. There we go. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Um, but what we're trying to talk about is being rooted, being grounded uh, in the Christian faith, being grounded uh, in God, Him being our foundation um, that we build our lives off of, Him being our uh, foundation that we um, make decisions through and make decisions uh, on. Uh, talking about having uh, convictions, what I've learned is that we believe a lot of different things, but convictions are those things that we'll stand on. Many believe in God until something doesn't work out their way. Uh, some, something happens, something in their life happens and they, they, they stop believing, so to speak. We believe in the Bible until we get to a verse or a passage that we, we don't like what it says. We don't like its implications uh, into our life. We believe in good and, uh, until we see evil. We believe in many, 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 many different things, but our convictions are the things that we will stand on. Convictions are the way that you prioritize your life. Whether you are conscious of that or know that or not, convictions are how you prioritize your life. Your convictions uh, determine how you live your life. And for every person who in here is a parent, you need to know that your convictions are what you pass on to your children. It isn't necessarily what you believe you pass on to your children. It's what your convictions are is what you pass on to your children. Because they watch us day in and day out. And so it isn't necessarily what we tell them. It's what they know to be true about us. Those are our convictions. And so that's sort of what we've been talking about in this series. Chapter 1, we talked about the thought or the, the conviction that Christ is supreme. He's not, he's not below any other. He's not equal to any other. He literally is supreme to all else. He is supreme in creation. The scriptures told us that, that everything was created by him, through him, and for him. And he holds it all together. The very fact that we're not all floating around this room today is only by the mere fact that God has created this world with this thing called gravity that keeps us on the ground. And not only that, he's supreme over the church. This isn't my church or your church. It's God's church. And because of that, we can take great comfort in uh, knowing that it's his church. It'll be here long after I'm gone because it's his church. If it was my church, it wouldn't. If it was your church, it wouldn't last past you. But because it's God's church, it is going to last forever. He told us that he was supreme in reconciliation. It is only through Jesus Christ that you have been saved. It's not through your good works. It's not through you're a good person. Not through your, your lineage or your heritage. Not because your grandmama loved God. It literally is the only way to be reconciled to God is through Jesus Christ. Christ. And then he, Paul even said, he is supreme over my ministry. 
I mean, Paul was humble enough and recognized that, that the great things that were being done through him were not by and of his own power. It was literally the power of God working through Paul. And though the people around him maybe not have recognized that, and the people around that sort of had Paul at this rock star type of status. They all wanted to meet him and hang out with him and talk to him. Even he said, it's, it's the power of God working through me. And so Christ is supreme, and so if he is supreme, chapter 2 told us, we should have our lives rooted in Christ. Makes sense, doesn't it? Makes sense that if he is supreme, he is the top, that that would be the place we would want to lay our life. That would be the place we would want to turn our lives. That, that would be the person we would want to build our lives on. The Bible says he is the solid rock that we can build our lives on. I had this thought this week as I was going over this again that, that Jesus is not into amendments. Let that sink in for a minute. He's, he's not into amendments. Because what Jesus said, what Jesus has taught us in his word, how he lived his life, why he died, how he died, his love for us was not based on what he thought. It literally was based on the character of God. It was his very essence that he lived out. It wasn't just a mere opinion or a thought. It literally was who he is. And so Jesus is not into amendments. Jesus uh, is not into changing his word, whether it's politically correct or not, whether it's culturally acceptable or not, whether it is socially feasible or not. God is not into amending his word because that would cause him to go directly against his very character. And he will not do that to us. So if you have Christ is supreme and we build our lives on Christ, last week we talked about chapter 3 that talked about the new creation that we become. Where we have a new perspective as a believer where our eyes are not on the things of this world, but our eyes are on the realities of heaven was the term that it used last week. Our eyes look a lot further, a lot longer. Even though, even the reason why we give money to, to buy this piece of property next door is not a, a today issue. It's a, it's a, a long-term issue. It isn't just how many people will be affected in this little building, but how many people might be affected in the buildings that sit over there, a medical clinic that we could reach out to the community through, a children's building where we could teach the, the, the children in a, in a more feasible way uh, the Word of God each week and maybe even several times a week. But we get a new perspective as a believer when we begin to root our lives in Christ. We begin to... Not that we don't enjoy this life, it's so like Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. The, the, the reality for all believers is, is that awaiting us is much better than whatever is here. We get a new perspective, we get new priorities on how we live. Kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, those kinds of things become important to us. I remember leading a, a high school wrestler to Christ uh, when I was a youth pastor. And he came from a rough home. His dad was abusive, actually. Maybe that's why it made him a good wrestler. I don't know. But, but he was a, a top-notch state high school wrestler. And uh, he happened to come to church one Sunday with, with another buddy, wrestler buddy who was a member of our church. Uh, he invited about five of his wrestler buddies to come. And, and, and literally, it wasn't that we gave a salvation message. We didn't have an altar call. We didn't, do, we didn't say a prayer. But literally, by the end of church that day, he came up to me and said, I want to become a Christian. Part of the reason he wanted to become a Christian was because of what he, what he had seen in Jason Honecker, the guy who was a member of our church, who was part of the wrestling team, but who was living out his faith in front of his wrestling team. And just if you've ever been on a high school wrestling team, they're a rough bunch of dudes. They're the guys who like to fight, right? And so, so Jason Honecker was living out his faith in front of them, and, and Charlie came to accept Christ that day. And I told him after, after we talked with him, after we shared with him, after we prayed with him, I said, this week is going to be one of the hardest weeks of your lives. He said, why? I said, because all the stuff you thought was funny last week at wrestling practice in the locker room isn't going to be funny this week. All the way that you want to fight your dad when he gets uh, hard on you and even sometimes abusive to you and you want to fight back, you're not going to do that now. And he didn't fully understand it. I just told him, I said, the presence of Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you to guide you. And so the things that you did last week, you're not going to do this week. He came back to me the following Sunday. He said, man, you were right. It was the roughest week of my life. 
He said, but I'm glad I'm a believer. I'm glad I'm a Christian. I'm glad I've made that decision. But we get new priorities. And we get a new peace about us. And it creates in us a new person. The old has passed away. The new has come. And so that's sort of what we've been talking through, this whole book of Colossians. Uh, today that leads us to what I would call the final word. The final word, Colossians chapter 4. Uh, we're actually just going to look at a few verses in it because the last part of chapter 4 is literally uh, pass this letter on, tell this person I said hey, those kinds of things. But the first few verses really pack a punch for the Christian life. Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, uh, it says, Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. It gives us here in these first six verses of chapter 4 two principles that I think are key to living the life for Christ. And so they're, they're statements, and I'm going to give them to you as we go. The first statement is this, the depth of your roots in Christ will be determined by your prayer life. The depth of your roots in Christ will be determined by your prayer life. Verse 2, it says, devote yourselves to prayer. So it just says, devote yourself, be committed to. It should be a regular part of our lives. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. An alert mind and a thankful heart. You need to realize that your mind is a target. Your mind is a target for the evil one, but it is also your defense for, for Christ. Your mind is what Satan likes to play on, and your mind is where you store those memory verses and those Bible verses about who God is. Your mind is a target that, God, that Satan tries to, to devour, tries to destroy, tries to tear down, tries to infiltrate, and at the same time your mind is the very place where you store your defense against that. So he says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. He says, pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about this mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Most of the valuable relationships you have in your life are because of the communication you have with them. Just think through your life, and I realize with social media, I, I, I may communicate with some people from my high school class that I haven't seen in 30 years, but realistically, my relationship with them is not very deep. Hey, congratulations on that. Hey, happy birthday today. Those kinds of things. The people that I have a deep relationship with are the people that I talk to face-to-face -to -face each week. It's my wife and my kids. It's many of you that I have conversations with. Those are my real relationships, and it's the same way with prayer. That is our relationship to God. While it is important for us to get into God's Word, and it is important, while it is important for us to worship with one another at regularly, and it is important, while it's important for us to, to give of our, our resources, our finances, our service, our time, that is important. While it is important uh, that we serve God regularly each week, we look at those opportunities to serve others for His name's sake, all of that is important. But the depth of your relationship will come through your community communication with Christ in prayer. So you can choose today to have a deep relationship with Christ or a shallow relationship with Christ. In fact, I would say this, I had this thought, prayer is the one thing no one can ever take from you. 
You might live in a communist country and they might take the Bible from you. You might live in a place where you don't have Wi-Fi so you can't get to your Bible app. You, all sorts of things can be taken from you, but prayer is the one thing that can never be taken from you. Listen to what some of these folks said. Martin Luther said, To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That's pretty critical. That's pretty important, I would say. Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, I know that the Lord is always on the side of right, but it is my constant anxiety and prayer that I and this nation may be on the Lord's side. Billy Graham said, to get nations back on their feet, we must first get down on our knees. We could complain all we want. We could gripe all we want. We could say, I like this, I don't like that, I like this person, I don't like that person. Well, it doesn't matter what news channel you want to watch, but the reality is our country will never come back until believers get on their knees and pray for it. Beth Moore said this, There are parts of our calling, works of the Holy Spirit, and defeats of the darkness that will come no other way than through furious, fervent, faith-filled, unceasing prayer. Reminded me of James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then it says the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power. It produces wonderful results. But my favorite quote that I found this week was from Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom said this, Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? Is it directing your day? Is it important enough that you can't go forward without it? Or is it just your rescue in a time of trouble. Most of us don't even think about our spare tire. In fact, I know people who've gone and bought new cars and don't even know if they have a spare tire because they've never thought about it until when they get a flat tire. And yet, if it was important to enough as a steering wheel, one, you notice it real quickly when it's not there and you don't go anywhere without it. And Corey Tim Boom is making that point to us about prayer. It should be that important to us. It should be directing our day that we literally can't go forward without it. And instead, most of us have it tucked in the trunk in case of emergency. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. I, I, I'm not sure. But did you know that we have a responsibility to pray for each other? Not just a, it would be nice if you would. Not just because we send a prayer list out and there's lots of names on there. By the way, one of, one of the people who've been on our prayer list for, for a couple of years passed away yesterday. And uh, so now their family has moved from the, this person is sick to now their family is, is grieving. And, and so we'll be praying for, for that family as well. But Ephesians 6.18 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent. And do you notice that Colossians 2 said stay alert or have an alert mind and Ephesians 6 said stay alert. There's something there uh, for that. And be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. We have a responsibility to pray for all believers everywhere. For my niece who is a believer living in the Middle East right now. For, for Ron and Graciela Lacey who are in Ukraine right now, halfway around the world. For Mercy Hill Church that is up in Kennesaw and meeting probably about now of the morning. For believers everywhere, we have a responsibility to be praying for them. You see, it's this communication that is so critical. It's this communication that should drive our day. We don't just send out a prayer list. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think there's people who put people on the prayer list and never look at the prayer list. And you say, how do I know that? Well, because I beg for people to keep us updated on the prayer list. And I've had a few people say, uh, well, that person, they got better six months ago. Or that person passed away. Or, or that person, I mean, 
if you put somebody on the prayer list, you should at least look at the prayer list. Uh, it should be, you know, we're not just trying to uh, compile a list of names. We literally are praying for folks who are sick or grieving, who are battling cancer. Uh, by the way, I'll give you an update. Steve Caldwell finished his second week of uh, chemo treatments. They took another scan. Uh, they saw more shrinkage in the tumors on his lungs. He has three. They saw more shrinkage in that. Uh, so he's going to continue up his chemo. Miss Marcia gets her port this week. Uh, and hopefully we'll begin next week or so uh, with her chemo and radiation treatment. So you pray for those folks. Uh, the, all the names on there represent a person, represent a family. Uh, and that's why we need to pray for each other. We have a responsibility ability to pray for each other. Not just if you'd like to, but literally is a responsibility. But did you know this? Did you know that Jesus prayed for you specifically? We know that Jesus prayed, obviously. Remember the time when the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. We remember the time when he took took the disciples and they were they were back in the in the in the 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 the, the wilderness or whatever and, and uh, he took Peter, James and John with him a little further in and, and he went and prayed and he came out and they were asleep. He woke them up. He said, pray with me. And he went off and he prayed again and he came back they were asleep again and he woke them up. Will you not pray with me? And so we know that Jesus prayed but I don't know if we knew that Jesus prayed for you specifically. Way back when. John 17 is a prayer of Jesus. John 17. I'm going to read the whole chapter, so I want you just to, to roll with me. It'll be up here behind me as we go through it. But uh, John 17 is a prayer of Jesus. In fact, if you have a Bible like mine that all the words that Jesus said are in red, this whole chapter other than about the first six words uh, are in red. It says, After saying these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, and here's where his prayer begins, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so He can give glory back to you. For you have given Him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given Him. And this is why, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into your glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave, you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I, I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for uh, this, is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me so, bring, so they bring me glory. Now I am departing from this world and they are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that no one was lost, except the one headed for destruction, as the scripture foretold. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take, take them out of the world, but keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world uh, more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world, and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will... That they will all be one just as you and I are one and as you are in me father I am in you and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me 
I have given them the glory you gave me, so they, they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given to me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will listen to them. This is a prayer that Jesus prayed right before he was arrested, right before he was taken off to what was going to be the most brutal of executions there has ever been. But did you notice what he said in verse 20? He said, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's you and I. If you're here today and you're a believer, guess what? You believe through the message that came from Jesus Christ to the disciples and from the disciples on. And so Jesus literally, all those years ago, prayed for you specifically. So the depth of your spiritual walk with Christ will be known by your prayer life. It will be determined by your prayer life. And quite honestly, there's no easier way to say this. It's your choice. You could choose a deep relationship with Christ. You could choose a shallow one. It's on you. And it's on me. It's not on Him. Here's the second statement as we finish up this series. While the depth of your roots will be determined by your prayer life, the fruit of your spiritual life will be found in your life lived. The fruit of your spiritual life will be found in your life lived. We often give great service, great lip service to the Christian life, but it really comes down to how we live. How would your neighbors respond if I went to them and told them you were a believer? Or if I told them you were a member of our church? How would your neighbors respond to that? Would your boss laugh at the notion that you are a believer, that you are a Christian? You see, how you live your life out each day is a, is, a, is a determination for the fruit that will come from your life. James 1.22 says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. So many of us, I've, I've heard this, this phrase before from a lot of people. We don't need God to say anything new to us. We need to obey what he's already said to us. We don't need a new revelation of any kind. We need to obey the revelation that has already been brought to us. And the fruit of our lives will be found in how we live out our lives. Acts chapter 1. It says, so when the apostles uh, were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? He said, the Father alone has the authority to set the dates and times that are not for you to know. And get this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. God does not call on you for the power of salvation. God does not call on you for the sacrifice of salvation. God does not call on you for the authority of salvation. But God does call on us to be a witness for salvation. You can't hide it. You can't duck it. You can't say, well, but what if, but what about this situation? You don't know where I work. You don't know where I live. You don't know all that's going on in my life. And all of that may be true. But he said, you will be my witnesses. And how you respond to where you work and how you respond to where you live and how you respond to the relationships you have and how you respond in your home are all testimonies to the faith of Christ that you may have. Second Timothy says this, he says, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. And here's what he says at the end of his life. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Three parts of that he said. He said, I have fought the good fight. 
the scriptures use the analogy a lot of times as a war. That literally while we are in this world, we are on enemy territory, we are in a spiritual war. Not, uh, not a lot unlike our soldiers who are in a physical war because in the end, the spiritual war comes at us to hurt us, kill us, destroy us. And not just us personally. It, it, for those of us who are in a family unit of some sort, it comes to tear and destroy our families. It comes to tear and destroy our marriages, our children. It, it, the war that we are in is very real and it is very literal. And though you don't see bullets flying by your head, the battle is every day. He said, I fought the good fight. Now, he didn't break down how he fought the good fight, but I believe he fought it by several different ways. One, I believe he fought it through prayer. I believe he fought it through prayer. I, I don't believe that, that he was any uh, less human than you and I are. So when he reached testings and trials and temptations, I believe that he fought it through prayer. I believe he fought it through what they knew in that day of God's Word. I believe he fought it in what he knew of that day of Jesus Christ and his time here on earth. He said, I finished the race. Can I just tell you, we're all involved in a race, and everybody race ends. It might be good if we knew what day our race was going to end, but we don't. And so we live every day as if we're in this race. And then he said, I have remained faithful. Think about that. I've fought a good fight. I mean, he, he's engaged in a fight. I've ran this race for years. And I've remained faithful. I believe in the heart of every believer here today. That would be your desire to say that at the end of your life. I really do. I believe that your deepest desire when your life comes to an end would be able to say, I fought a good fight, I have ran the race, and I have remained faithful. So let me ask you, what are you convicted about? What are your convictions? What is your life rooted in? What is your life grounded in? Man, what is it that you are teaching and showing your children by the way that you live as a parent or an adult? What is your conviction today? If your conviction is to be able to say that at the end of your life, then you need to draw your roots deep. You need to draw your spiritual life deep. And that's my goal for us today as we end this series. Let's pray.